Look at you. And then admit all. All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us again. And we are really excited this evening to have uh, four fantastic educators with us um, to discuss rehearsal techniques. Um, I won't bother introducing them. Um, I think they will do a better job of that. And so um, we will go one by one here and um, just give us a brief introduction about yourself and a little bit about your background. And let's start with uh, Dr. Thornton on this one. Good evening, everybody. Uh, great to be here with everyone. Uh, my name is David Thornton. I am the Associate Director of Bands at Michigan State University, also the director of the Spartan Marching Band. Uh, my job here on campus entails conducting the University Symphony Band and can, teaching courses in uh, instrumental conducting. I also um, cover all of the athletic bands here at MSU. Uh, prior to doing my graduate degrees at MSU, I uh, taught public school in Florida for five years. I was a director of bands at Leon High School and um, also taught middle school uh, during my public school teaching experience. And I uh, did my undergraduate degree at Florida State University in clarinet performance and music education. So looking forward to uh, learning from everybody this evening. Thank you. And let's go with um, Wendy. Hi, everybody. I'm Wendy Higdon. I am the director of bands at Creekside Middle School in Carmel, Indiana. And um, I am a career middle school band director. I've spent all 29 of my years teaching middle school. And um, I am happy to be here tonight, thrilled to be here, and, and excited to uh, hear what everybody has to say. Great. Thank you. And Chip? Hi, um, I'm Chip DiStefano. I am director of bands at McCracken Middle School in Skokie, Illinois. Um, this is uh, wrapping up my 24th year there. And uh, like Wendy, this is uh, middle school has been my spot, my niche, uh, my entire career. Thank you. And Beth. Hi, everybody. I'm Beth Peterson. I'm an associate director of bands at University of Illinois. I'm in my fifth year there where I conduct the wind orchestra. Um, I teach a conducting rehearsal techniques methods course. I place all of our music education student teachers. And um, before that, I taught at Ithaca College in upstate New York for 17 years, um, music education, and um, had a, either the brass choir or one of the bands there to conduct. And then before that, I have 10 years of public school teaching experience from um, suburban high school in Chicago to um, fourth through 12th grade instrumental. where I had 12 kids in the high school band. All right, and thank you all for your introductions there. This is Aris, and we're gonna just hop right in with our first question. Um, and there are a few parts to it. So first, describe your rehearsal preparation process. And within that, what are the key components or things that you do prior to engaging with your ensemble? For example, what are you looking for as you score study in regard to rehearsal considerations? And how does your score study influence your approach to the rehearsal? And let's start with uh, Dr. Peterson for this one. Okay, um, I'm going to start with, with just score study. I think um, for me, it's about um, getting to that first rehearsal and then getting to the performance. And it depends on the piece a little bit. Um, so I try to focus when I'm studying a score on um, what I would consider the elements of music and what I also believe are um, the reasons why we do music, you know, the, the craft of the piece and the art of music, which involves um, melody, harmony, rhythm, tone, color, and form. And if I can understand why a composer or how a composer has crafted those elements, um, then I can take that to the first rehearsal. Um, I, I think it was Elizabeth Green, um, uh, and maybe Anthony, you can in the chat write in the, um, who she was and, and the, the um, contribution she made to conducting from University of Michigan. Um, I think she said the first rehearsal for the conductor is the is our first performance. So I try to get to that first rehearsal and share with my students why I'm excited about that piece. Um, and so sometimes it might be, um, I, I'll call it like a preview spots. You know, I want them to hear these great themes that tie the piece together. This is what I learned about the pieces. I studied it. Um, and, and usually for me, that's about playing a little bit first. 
Um, it's not so much me talking about the history of the piece, although some of that's going to happen um, uh, throughout that process. But so for me, it's, it's getting to that first rehearsal um, by understanding the organization of the piece and the artistic process that the composer used as much as I can. Um, and, um, and then I also believe there's a little bit of, of working that the ensemble does on me in that first rehearsal. In other words, we might read through the piece and I'm trying to make it as successful as I can. I'm trying to make it as musical as I can in that first rehearsal, but depending on the piece and the, and the, uh, um, what the ensemble is giving back, we sort of work together to figure out what the next rehearsal is going to be. Um, and then that's how I prepare for that next rehearsal. And, and I continue to do that through the performance. Um, I'm, I'm studying that music, um, from that beginning time all the way to the to the concert I, the day of a concert i still go through and conduct the piece and i still make sure that um gesture wise i can get through everything and I, my brain is where it needs to be for everything um i also want to say and then i'll, I'll finish up my part of the, the question I, I believe there are four parts to that that preparation process i believe there's score study there's score marking there's uh, rehearsal preparation and there's conducting practice and those are four different things. And I think some people think, well, if I'm just conducting in the mirror, I'm studying the score. I don't, I don't think, I think that's different. So I think all four of those aspects go into that process for me. Thanks. All right, great, thank you. Um, if we could hear from Chip next. Uh, yeah, for me, teaching younger kids, it, it really has to do more with my score study ties way more into rehearsal preparation than actual score study. Um, the traditional, the way you were taught in college conducting class, the, I'm thinking specifically of the Frank Battisti book of uh, his score study that he did with Richard Garofalo, um, where score study, the purpose of score study is to develop that perfect mental image of what you want the music to sound like just by looking at the score. Um, but when, when I'm looking at the score, it, it's mostly planning for what the, that next rehearsal is. And, and for me, I'm really heavy into recording my rehearsals and listening back while I'm looking at the score, which um, to me, that's just the perfect type of preparation because it's rehearsal reflection and preparation at the same time. So I'm looking at the score, I'm listening to that rehearsal recording and I'm making lots and lots and lots of lists of long-term goals, short-term goals, things we're gonna hit at the next rehearsal, things we're gonna hit at the next week. Um, and these are these are lists that I share with the kids too. So if, uh, if, if we, uh, are preparing for something i'm making a list of what we need to fix that's on their chair the next day for that next rehearsal and in many cases especially if it's something pretty simple they're expected to fix whatever's on that list um, without us even having to rehearse it you're supposed to take a pencil mark it down write that change and, and hopefully we've saved some rehearsal time by doing that that's all i got all right, and let's go to uh, Wendy on this one. Uh, hi, everybody again. Um, like Chip, you know, I think the, the process when you're dealing with young musicians is just a little bit different. Um, as I'm looking through scores, uh, a lot of things I'm, I'm considering are what are the pitfalls that the musicians are going to encounter as they're playing and then coming up with those strategies to deal with those pitfalls. Um, again, as Chip said, you know, how are we going to rehearse that? What kind of um, what kind of exercises do we need to do? What kind of drills do we need to do? Can we pull something in into our fundamental set that will help to address something that might be challenging for kids uh, in the rehearsal? Um, looking at it from um, the standpoint of just instrument pedagogy, with um, you know, alternate fingerings that we might have to use or um, pieces of information that the kids might need that they don't have already, making sure that we're bringing those, those skills in. Um, same, same as, as a Chip, we, we make lists of what we need to work on. Um, a lot of times um, I have a co-director and so we will, um, we'll spend a lot of time in sectionals, um, usually woodwind and brass and then percussions in there somewhere. Um, but when we do come together, one of us is, is on the podium and the other one of us is with a score seated right behind taking notes. And so we, we take copious notes as to what, what needs to happen and what needs to fix so that we can then drill down on those uh, things in those subsequent rehearsals. But yeah, it's a, it's, it's a lot more um, 
trying to predict what kind of what kind of challenges um, these young musicians are going to face and what kind of skills they're going to need to get through those. Great, great. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Thornton. Sure, I have a couple of things uh, to offer. Um, I think when I'm thinking about rehearsal planning, um, a big thing that I am thinking about is kind of the macro, micro, macro um, as it relates to the preparation for our performance. I'm sure we've all heard of that in some form or fashion. Um, for me, my group generally has anywhere from eight to 12 rehearsals. So um, I have to be pretty scripted with our time and how much time we're gonna spend on a certain piece. So I'm pretty aware of where we are in that process. Um, you know, when we start out, it's a lot of big picture ideas. First rehearsal, what do the students need to know about this piece that will help us be even more successful when we come back to the next rehearsal, which for us is two days later. So, um, you know, trying to systematically organize my thoughts and my approach um, um, for that. Um, you know, my goal for the first rehearsal is to be performance ready as best as best as I can. And like uh, Beth mentioned, you know, I'm constantly studying the music, you know, rethinking what we're doing, reimagining what I'm doing, practicing, internalizing, um, and, and being very thoughtful. I love what Chip said about recording every rehearsal. I do that and I listen to those recordings. That's the best thing that I can do for my rehearsal preparation uh, because it allows me to hear things that I'm not hearing. Um, and then when you go back to that next rehearsal, you're going to hear so much more clearly um, the, the little details that you recognize on a Zoom recorder. And if you can make it sound really great on a Zoom recorder, then things are probably going pretty good. So uh, the Zoom recorder is very, very honest. I'll just offer one other thing that, that I've kind of synthesized a process for myself. Um, it's kind of in four steps. Uh, preparation, practice, planning, and then obviously your rehearsal process. So Preparation is, is the study part, it's the marking, it's all the things with the score. Um, like Beth mentioned, the practicing component, the internalizing, the, 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 the things that are challenging, whether it's a tempo change or there's some mixed meter, um, but the practicing part for you can be really, can be really beneficial. Um, then the, the planning part of how we're going to approach the music and then when once we get into the rehearsal process, what are the things that, that I'm going to be doing to make my students perform at the highest level possible? And what am I going to do to teach them? And for younger students, that process is critical. Like, how are you going to get them to conceptualize said skill? And I know we'll probably get into that later, uh, later this hour. So those are a couple things uh, that, that work for me. Great. Thank you so much for that. Um, so going on to the next question here. Um, what do you all consider the essential components of uh, the warm-up or fundamentals uh, portion of your rehearsal? Um, if you guys could talk a bit about that. And let's start with uh, Chip on this one. Sure. Uh, for me, it's all about tone and pitch for that, for that opening routine of the, of the, of the rehearsal. Um, we spend every day doing long tones, um, both just, you know, concert F or whatever the, the pitch of the week happens to be, not necessarily pitch of the week or whatever tone, tone center, pitch center we're working on. Um, and Remington studies along that. And then we spend a considerable amount of time doing corrals and doing breathing exercises um, and trying to develop both the sound of the individual students and doing the things that we need to do so that their individual tones improve and get better. Um, but also developing the tone of the ensemble because uh, developing the tone of the ensemble um, requires different skills than de developing the tone of the individual um, where the tone of the ensemble has has a lot to do with balance and blend and timbre and those types of things. So trying to get the kids listening for those areas. Um, so a lot of breathing exercises, a lot of corrals. Um, and then the third thing we spend a lot of time on is articulation and working on articulation studies. So I, I think if you came into to one of our rehearsals um, in that first 10 to 20 minutes, depending on, on how long we were working on it that day, you'd see us working a lot with tone, pitch, and articulation um, pretty religiously every day. Great. Thank you. And Dr. Peterson. Um. So I conduct the wind orchestra and, and it's the second band at Illinois and I, I see some faces that have been in the group or um, are still in the group. Um, 
And I honestly go back and forth because it's a college band of mostly music majors um, and some really fine non-music majors of, about whether or not I need to do a warm up. And so some days I feel like, you know, this is a professional group. We're going to come in and play the A at one o'clock and let's go. I'm assuming you've warmed up on your own. Um, I, I, you know, certainly when I do an honor band or conduct a, uh, and taught in the middle or the, the public schools, um, that wasn't the case. Um, like Chip, I think tone and the opportunity to listen to sort of have that sacred moment of just, okay, quiet, relax, focus on making music together is really important. And um, so for those of you in wind orchestra, if we do a warm up that day, it's because I'm watching you come into the room and it's, it's a little scattered or it's the middle of the semester or it's the middle of our concert cycle. And I feel like we need to do that, that warm up time. Um, it might be a Remington, it might be building corrals, um, I'm sorry, building a, a, a scale in a, in a round. Um, one of the things I like to do when I work with younger students is to, to say B flat concert is our warm up. Everybody play it in whole notes. Don't repeat the top note. And if you're a Yankees baseball fan, you're a one. If you're a Mets baseball fan, you're a two. And if you don't care about baseball, you're a three. Like that worked really well when I was in New York. Um, and you know, you can adjust that to, uh, to your location. Cause for younger kids, I think that makes it kind of fun for them and they're listening to that um those chords build up so i believe warm-up time is um is about mind you know getting your mind focused um it's about breathing it's opportunity to listen uh to tune and then i especially think um uh it should pertain if you're going to do scales or rhythm or articulation it should pertain to the music you're doing that day uh, so you're pulling, you know, something out, a key or a mode or a rhythm that you're going to be working on next. And I'll do that at the college level. You know, I might have them play a D flat major scale that day because we're going to start in D flat or something every so often I'll do that. Um, and then if I don't do a warm up, often I will, I will pick a, the slow ballads sort of lyrical piece that we might be working on as a, uh, as music to warm up on and be the first thing we'll work on that day. I tend to feel like, and I, I, I would ask my, my other three colleagues on the panel, um, I tend to feel like the, 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 the beginning of the rehearsal is the time where you can get the most done. People are the most focused. So I also tend to put um, in that spot early in the rehearsal the, the music that I think is the hardest or that we really need to hit pretty hard that day. Great, thank you. And Wendy? Um. I'm going to echo a lot of the things that we've already heard uh, this evening. I think, you know, my approach to fundamentals is um, both in terms of sound and skill, as well as just a mental focus. So uh, typically we're going to start off and, and um, we, we may take a few, um, few minutes to just do some breathing, uh, just to kind of get the mind sharpened and get the room calmed down, especially for middle schoolers. Um, but then we're absolutely we're focusing on on sound um, and getting the kids to listen. Uh, I tell my students every time you play something, you need to have an opinion about what you just heard, and um, they know that we may ask them what their opinion is. Um, we work a lot on just developing a, a resonant, vibrant sound with no tension. We work on entrances, releases, breathing articulation, um, balance. We work on uh, making sure that you're matching the sound of the people around you, making sure that you always have somebody else's sound in your ears and you're working to match that. Um, articulation is a big part of, uh, of our fundamental set. Um, can we be consistent in the way we articulate? Um, and just really, really working on making those skills, those fundamental skills reflex so that when we move to the literature, we know how to release, we know how to time the breath, we know how to take a two count relaxed breath, we know how, to, how, how we're going to approach um, a tunido articulation or a, a staccato articulation um, because we've addressed those daily in, in that fundamental set. Great, thank you. And David. I'll add a couple perhaps things uh, that are different to what's already been said. And I, I see somebody's asked a question about recommended time for warm up. Uh, to answer that question quickly, I think that would depend on how much time you have with your students on a, in a rehearsal period. If it's a 50 minute class, uh, that's going to be, that's going to be a, a fairly quick warm up. 
after you have them get their instruments out, put their instruments away at the end of class, you do a warm up, and then you have your 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 music that you're working on. If it's an hour and a half class, and certainly that warm up could could look certainly a little bit differently. So I would I would um, just depending on where you are in your process, that that may also fluctuate. Um, so I. I it could kind of depend uh, however your situation is. Um, I'll say in my situation, the expectation is that our students come into the rehearsal and that they're warmed up and we take a pitch and we go. I mean, that, that's, that's my scenario now. Um, and I realize that's not the reality for probably most of us that are here. So I'm going to give credit to my, my wife, Holly, who teaches middle school band, uh, beginning band. And she said something to me one time that I still think about a lot is the warm up time is not only for the ensemble in public school, but it's also for the individual. And so when they're running into the room and they haven't played their trumpet yet, and if you want to do all these really intense musical things, you've got to be aware of the warm up that you're doing for your brass players, your woodwind players. What does everybody need in the room? What are your percussionists need? So I think about that a lot. Um, you know, when I'm working in the public school or if I'm doing an honor band, like the warm up is yes about what we're doing as a group but in your situation it could also be about what you're doing for your individual students. Um, or if you teach band at 7:30 in the morning because it's first period or zero period, they're running into and they haven't even touched their horn that day. So um, it, those things could be, could be something for everybody to think about. Um, for us, one of the things that I love, uh, Chris Sharp, uh, who is, uh, has been affiliated with the University of Florida, has this a warm up called tonality shifting, which I absolutely love. Um, so if you're not familiar with that, I would highly recommend that you explore that. Um, it's fantastic. We use it at MSU. Um, of course, Bach Corrals, the Mayhew and Lake uh, setting are, are terrific, but um, sound is the most important. That's something that um, that, that, that I really believe in. And, and just maybe one thing to think about sound and warm up is uh, the way that, that I set up my ensemble is so that everybody's listening toward the middle. So all of my principal players are in the middle of the ensemble and, you know, clarinets from left to right, third clarinet, second clarinet, first clarinet, we're all listening in toward the middle so that the principal players can listen and everybody can match down the row. Um, and so those are some things that have helped us in warming up and listening. I think uh, Wendy said listening, which is absolutely right. I mean, we want to make sure that we're responding and making music together. Um, but, but also being, a, being aware that, that we do have to also provide perhaps a warm up for our students that have not played our instruments on certain days. And so depending on your situation, that could vary, um, uh, you know, on a daily basis or um, just how you kind of function. So those are a couple of things to tie, tie, tie up what everybody else has already said, which has been great. All right, excellent. Thanks, thanks to all of you for those answers. Um, if we can move on to the next question, which is how do you develop intonation skills within your ensemble? Are there any specific resources that you use in your process? And can we start with Wendy? Yes, this time? we can. Um, you know, developing intonation skills from the beginning when they don't know anything about it is um, is always challenging. And so we talk with our young young students once they are once they're playing with a char characteristic sound, whether that's second semester of the first year or first semester of the second year, kind of depends on the group. But we talk a lot about um, what kind of factors affect intonation. We talk about how to read a tuner. We talk about the purpose of a tuner. We talk about um, things with their instrument that can affect their intonation, and we kind of give them some background knowledge. Um, you know, I'm a firm believer that if we can play with a with a resonant characteristic sound, that's going to um, eliminate the majority of our intonation challenges and allow us to focus. Um, beyond that, I do a ton of work with the drone. Um, we have a harmony director in each of our uh, rooms that we utilize. But if you don't have a harmony director, you can certainly use um, a recorded drone or the Tonal Energy app. Um, but we do a lot of drone work uh, on a daily basis. And then um, last year, we picked up the new um, tuned in book that uh, Brian Balmages and Robert Herrings did. It is a game changer. I love it. It, was, it absolutely upped our, our ability to play in tune um, by leaps and bounds just by playing through those exercises. And all of those are, are based on, uh, they have one uh, a page or two pages on every key. Um, they have corrals, they have tuning corrals, they have um, everything with a drone. That was a great, great resource, um, but that, that helped tremendously. 
in order to kind of make it a focus for the kids as well as for us. Great. If we could hear from Dr. Thornton next. Absolutely. Um, so tone is the most important thing. So um, if we're, we're striving for tone every day, then that gives us a, um, a place to start. Um, I, I think listening and trying to blend uh, your sounds with the person that's next to you. One of my little um, uh, things that I say regularly is to listen to your trio. That's not revolutionary. Uh, that's from Dick Floyd and his book, um, The Artistry of Teaching and Making Music, which is a great text. But listening to your trio and trying to fit within the sound of the person on either side of you or in front or behind you. Um, I think those things are, are, um, are important, you know, and pitch is something that is not, is not going to get better overnight. I mean, it's something that we've constantly are working on. And so I, I think, I think our role on a daily basis is to help, help our students, uh, hear it, help our students understand how to address it, help our students with, you know, the technical details of what we're doing, but also just remind them that we're listening for it and that, you know, sometimes it's not going to be better right now. Um, you know, another thing that we can do is empower our students to go, if there's something that's really not working in the music that you're working on, ask them to do it outside of rehearsal. And I believe that a seventh grader could do that or, or a high school senior, anybody can do that. I think we just have to ask the students to take some ownership of that. Um, and I think you'd be surprised by, um, what the, what the students can do. Um, I mentioned the, the tonality shifting uh, exercise as a warm up, but this is also works on pitch. Just to give you a quick idea of what it is, everybody starts on unison concert F and then breaks into a triad and F major, and then goes back to unison concert F, and then the next chord after unison F is D flat major. So now your role in the chord is totally different, and those of you that have been on F for three whole notes, now you're the third, and so you have to adjust. So the tonality shifting thing is kind of a one-stop shop for a lot of what we're discussing. Uh, the ball mages uh, text is also terrific. So uh, we use a harmony director at MSU, uh, you know, periodically a tonal energy is also great. Um, I, I believe that students don't know what in tune is until they experience it. And the best way to do that is to use some technology, whatever is accessible in your situation to help them understand that they can understand that there are wiggles in the sound that need to go away. And how do you do that? Sharp, flat, adjust, whatever the technique is on their instrument, and they can do that. Um, but they have to experience it so that they can replicate that feeling um, and what they're hearing. So those are my two cents. Great. And I know that um, I, we can have Chip speak next, but what I, I do want to say this is a lead in for him. Um, if you've never explored the McCracken Middle School Band website, you should do that because he has a ton of resources on there, um, some of which deal with the intonation issue as well as um, have corrals written for young men and all those things. But I will let him branch out from that point, and I'll post that website link to his website here in the chat in just a second. Chip. Thank you. Um, I also want to point out that another FJH book, in addition to Robert's book, um, is uh, Tim, Tim Lost and I uh, just released this past fall a book called Corrals and Beyond, which is essentially our, the warm-up routine that I've been doing with McCracken Bands for pretty much my entire career, just kind of written out um, as well. And uh, if, if, if what some of what I'm describing kind of resonates, then uh, that, that book might be a nice resource for you and your program. Um, I think one of the, the most important things is that, that pitch and intonation is a student responsibility. And the sooner that we take it away from the director's responsibility and hand it to the students and give them ownership of that, um, the quicker it's going to, to improve. And I, I think we've all, we've all been there standing in front of the ensemble with the tuner kind of going down the row saying, nope, sharp, nope, flat. And just because we're in a pinch and, and, and we got to kind of get through things. Um, but that's not really particularly good teaching. And we wanna make sure that we're giving the kids an opportunity to experiment, um, to try different things um, and see if they can make it better on their own um, without the director's, with, with the director's guidance maybe, but not really with the director's help because we want them to be able to adjust on the fly in performance. We, we can't be shouting to them, hey, no, that's sharp, that's flat, or even giving them fingers up, fingers down type of stuff in the middle of the performance. They need to hear that it's out of tune and adjust. 
Um, and then more to that end, I don't even know if it's that important that students know whether they're sharp or flat. They just need to be able to distinguish whether they're in tune or out of tune. And then from there, they just know they have to make a they have to make a choice, and that choice is going to be based on on their experience, on their gut instinct, um, and uh, just kind of knowledge of their own playing and their own instrument to make an adjustment. And then from there, it either got better or worse. And if it got better, they keep going. And if it got worse, they switch in the other direction. Um, and I think last thing in terms of developing intonation skills, um, we do sing a lot. But it's not just the singing and the humming that's important for the development. I think it's what we sing. Um, and I don't know how I figured this out, but kids have a tendency when they sing scales to sing using just intonation. So when they're singing a major scale, they will naturally lower the third just on their own. Um, so I found that by alternating um, whatever, uh, whatever we're working on in the pitch, whether it's in the repertoire or whether it's in a crowd that we're working on, if I'll have them sing scales, if I'll have them sing scale patterns and then go to the rep, they'll automatically make some of those pitch adjustments on their own because they've, uh, they've done that. So we're not necessarily even singing the repertoire, we're just singing the scales that uh, the, rep, the key the, rep, the repertoire is in. Okay, great. And if we could hear from Dr. Peterson. Um, hi, again. Um, I'll add to what David was saying about the, the listening trios. Um, I learned this from Paula Kreider, also a Texas band director. Um, I, I saw her rehearse and she had the students play a note and said, listen or play it so you can hear yourself. And then she had them play. So if you do that first, before you listen to the trio, I, the sound changes so drastically when all of a sudden you ask people to listen to the people next to you or in front of you or behind you. And the, 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 the whole tone will change. Um, I agree with all my colleagues that the tone is so important first. Like they're not going to play in tune if they're not playing with a, a resonant sound. Um, uh, I used to do when I taught it at the Go College, I would have students um, with an intonation chart. And I learned this from Mark Fonder, one of my colleagues there. Um, they had to turn it in and they had to actually um, check with the tuner the intonation tendencies of their entire um, chromatic range of their instrument. Um, and come back in and share that. So I knew that they knew what notes tended to be out of tune on their instrument. Um, I do a lot of isolating and rehearsal. Um, you know, let's just hear the melody right here. I think that gives them a chance to hear each other and know with whom they're playing, know with whom they're playing the same notes. Um, and um, you might, in, when you're doing that, if you're, if you're isolating a phrase, ask them, hey, what was the most out of tune note in that? form as your phrase and they you know they might come up with the right answer or a different answer but they're listening and then do it again they're listening again now that, that you, they know you're going to ask them to make some decisions um and finally i think we just need to give them a chance i will build into my rehearsal hey we're going to tune this chord right here and i'm going to spend a little bit of time telling everybody or making letting them listen to know with whom they're playing that part of the chord um, and that's part of the rehearsal plan. And when I do that, and, and even with young kids, they can usually, if they're playing with good tone, they can hear it and they'll make those adjustments. I just think we don't give them the time, time to do that. So those would be my suggestions. Great, thank you. So um, for our next question, we want how, actually before I even get to the, to the question, um, much like Chip and the McCracken band, um, Wendy has a pretty amazing website as well, um, which we are going to post the link. It's on and off the podium.com. So highly encourage you to check that out. There's many great resources on there. Um, but this, uh, this question is, um, so if each of you could talk about how you address, teach, reinforce, balance, and blend within your rehearsal process um, and, and speak to that. So let's, uh, let's actually start with Wendy again this time. Okay, well, I think, you know, I think I've already kind of touched on some of the things that we do for balance and blend, um, you know, making sure that, that they are always have someone else's sound in their ears. Um, we talk about listening to the trios, although with my young kids, I, I talk about the three friends, um, and, and we have to match the sound of our of ourselves and our two friends that are next to us, our three friends. Um, you know, I think that we... Um, especially the young musician isn't isn't keenly aware of those sounds around him or her um, they are so focused on trying to do it right themselves if you think about 
beginner musician and everything that they have to kind of process and then physically do, they have no idea until we, we kind of train them how to listen to those people around them. So making that a practice, we do a lot of, um, we'll play something simple. A lot of times it's a fundamental exercise and we'll just practice verbalizing what it is we hear. And that also gives kids a chance to kind of do a self check. Um, so that's one way that we address balance and blend. We talk about um, not wanting any stick outs. And so we talk about well, what kinds of things would cause your sound to stick out of the texture. And for us, keeping it very simple, I'm too loud. I'm playing with a different tone quality than the people around me, or I'm playing out of tune. And then we work to try to address those three issues um, as we go. For a little bit more advanced kids, you know, as we move on um, into seventh and eighth grade, our, which is for us our second and third year, um, our beginners don't ever get to rehearse at a full band. Uh, they are in um, they're in mixed instrument classes, but um, but there's a, a limited number of instruments per class, somewhere between three, three and five instruments per class. Um, but for the older kids, getting them to start to listen, um, we talk about different kinds of balance. We aren't always talking, you know, we, you hear about the pyramid of sound, that's one way to balance, but we are also talking about balance and melody to harmony, melody to bass line, um, uh, prominent parts to subordinate parts, um, we kind of get the kids to, to listen and, and think about multiple ways to balance and what should be the prominent part. What should we be listening for? Um, sometimes we'll use recordings to help kind of peek their ears a little bit and get them to think about you know, what is it that I should be hearing. Uh, sometimes we'll use our own playing. Um, you have to use a lot of different tools with young kids but to get them to think about these things. And it's tough, but they can absolutely do it. Wonderful, thank you. And Dr. Peterson. Um, if you have the melody at letter A, play now. So I think that does a couple things, right? It, it lets the, you know, if they know they have the melody, um, it, it lets everybody else know they have the melody. Sometimes the harmony plays <laughs> and you go, wait, wait, maybe that's not the melody. I mean, it, but it, it, it allows you to have a conversation with them about what the different parts and functions of, of the music are. And so um, I'll ask them questions like that. Um, I also will use um, just geography. Like if, if I do an honor band, I might have for the, you know, the afternoon part of the rehearsal, I'll have the tubas and euphonium sit in the front row and the flutes go in the back of the room. Um, it's, you know, it's a, it's again, it's a balancing. Maybe, maybe those are the instruments that I need to hear more of are up front or we want to hear more of are, are up front. Um, and maybe uh, I'll do this even in the college level is, um, is uh, you know, saxophone stand up and just play your part here. Um, so we're, we're highlighting who we want to hear more of it, at that moment, like who the focus or the spotlight is on. But I think it is a lot of asking them questions and making those decisions together, leading them to, yeah, this is what we want to hear, or, you know, trombones, you're a little too loud for the trumpets there, or, um, uh, you know, asking clarinets, are the, you know, who are you hearing too much of right here? So you're, in, you're engaging them um, in, making, in making those decisions too. Um, there's that old sit next to someone who plays a different instrument than you um, and and play in that setup um, which I think is great because they start to hear other things in the music that are really important to them um, so that might help with with balance and blend too great thank you and chip so I, I guess I'm going to answer this question in a couple of different ways one the first is in terms of how it has to do with just the core sound and what I want our ensemble to actually sound like. Um, and a lot of that is, is through the kids' individual tone qualities being good, but it's also just through the balance and blend of the ensemble. And so the things, the things that I end up finding myself saying a lot are, are trumpets are balancing to the trombones, saxophones are balancing to the horns, and the flutes are balancing to the clarinets. And making sure that, that, that the trumpets can play as loud as the trombones, but never louder. Um, and, and same with the saxes and the horns and the flutes and clarinets. Um, and then something I also that, that stole from Robert Herrings and Cindy Lansford that I say all the time is, is brass is the power, woodwinds are the color, and making sure, making sure that the core of the sound is coming from the brass and, and the woodwind color um, kind of supplements that. And then more towards uh, 
kind of the repertoire, depending on what the repertoire needs. Um, we, we've all heard of, the, of that, the, the Francis Big Bath Pyramid of Sound, which if I'm being honest with everybody, doesn't resonate with me at all. Um, and so I like to think of it more in terms of the band being made up of a bunch of little triangles and not, not one big giant big triangle. Um, and those little triangles are the clarinet section and making sure that the clarinet section is its own pyramid of sound, making sure the brass choir is its pyramid of sound, making sure the saxophone choir is its pyramid of sound. And then those choirs blend together, together to create the timbre that we're looking for. Um, and then also dividing by what's happening in the music. So if the melody is in octaves, that melody needs to be its own pyramid of sound. That lower octave needs to be louder than the higher octave. Um, if there's three octaves, that lowest octave needs to be louder than the middle and so forth. Um, and a lot of times when you're looking at it that way, you're fighting the composer because the composer doesn't always score it in such a fashion where he'll write the first and second clarinet part up an octave and the third clarinet part by themselves will be down an octave. So we need to help the composer out by rescoring that a little bit. Um, but, but also just in, or, you know, melody and then the accompaniment, making sure the, the accompaniment has its, its own pyramid of sound. And so kind of taking it by the function of the part and making sure those parts are their pyramids and also the individual choirs in the band and making sure those choirs are their own pyramids. Great, thank you. And Dr. Thornton. I would say that the concept of balance and blend is relative. Um, and I think what's important to think about with these concepts, because they really apply to a variety of musical topics that we're talking about, melody, harmony, intonation, sound, balance, you know, it, it kind of, I, I think it covers a, a wide variety of things. I think what's important for everybody to remember is that as long as we have an opinion about how we want it to go and what the goal is, then that will help us with the said thing that we're trying to achieve, if that makes sense. So, you know, like people have mentioned the, rel the, the pyramid of sound or what our sound may we want to be here. But if you ask the four of us or the six of us that are, that are leading this discussion tonight about some part of music, we'd all probably have a different opinion on how we want that to go. And that's okay. But I think, I, I think what's important to, uh, to consider maybe in this question, just to take it in a different direction, is that you've thought about all of those little details. You know, in this, this passage where everybody's playing this major chord, what do you want to hear? You know, maybe it's not that the tubas need to be the loudest thing here. Maybe you want the horns to be the loudest sound here. Um, in terms of uh, maybe with younger students, maybe the question that you ask is, what do we want the audience to hear? What are we trying to convey in this music? Um, how, what are we trying to have uh, come through the ensemble? Um, so I think listening is a big part of that. Uh, asking questions is, is something that I, I try and do a lot in my rehearsals, but it all starts with us as the teacher having an opinion about how we want the music to go, how we want to teach that. Um, and one of the things that I have been thinking a lot about in all of our free time these days is how can I get my students to interact with each other in the moment more? How can they pass off the melody from the saxophone to the flute players? Or how can I get the students to be more engaged about what's going on in the music during our, during our time together and perhaps after our time together? Um, and so there's, a, there's a, probably a lot of ways that you can do that within the, the context of how your classroom operates. But um, I, think, I think it's important for us to know what we're trying to communicate to the audience and then how we're communicating that intention to the students and how seeing what their opinions may or may not be and how we can get them to interact with each other about that. I think, um, I think that could be uh, meaningful in our music making. So just something perhaps a little different on that topic. Great, thanks. Right. Before, before we move on, sorry, Dr. Golden. Uh, Joshua had a question for uh, Chip specifically about um, do you, are your choirs, your pyramids, uh, triangles, are they always the same or do they change um, based on the piece or the concept? I, I think the choirs are the same, but whether we're focusing on those choirs depends on the repertoire. So if, if it's a more chorale-like thing, then yes, we're li well, I'm listening for the individual choirs to see if they're balanced the way I would like them to be. Um, but if we're playing a march, I'm, I'm not, well, I'm gonna say yes for, if we're playing a march, yes, I still want that saxophone choir to be balanced as their own little mini pyramid or the clarinet choir to be 
balances their mini pyramid um, while also focusing in on how the, the parts function. So that's kind of a non-answer to it. Yeah, yes, but it kind of depends. But yeah, it kind of depends. But yes, I'm kind of keeping those wires fairly consistent in my mind. Great, thanks. All right, our next question um, is related to um, one of the newer concepts that we are um, exploring in ensemble rehearsals, and that is kind of the Orpheus model of rehearsing, which is a more collaborative setting. Um, for you all, how do, you, how do we guide our students through this and how do we um, establish techniques that allow them to collaborate in rehearsals, but also al allow us to achieve the interpretation that our score study has brought us to? Um, let's have Dr. Thornton start with that question. Well, I think this can be a valuable teaching tool. Um, and you have to be prepared for their answer to be something that you're maybe not okay with. If you're really going to go down this route, then you have to be prepared for it to maybe go in a different way than what you were expecting. And that can be okay. That can absolutely be okay. But you have to come to terms with that. Um, and I learned that a little bit uh, through experience. Um, I've done this a couple different times. I've done some pieces unconducted. I've let students rehearse um, themselves. That may be, that's certainly easier to do uh, at the university level um, in some cases than it is with middle schoolers. But I think, um, I think you have to create an environment where people are not afraid to have an opinion and give students early an opportunity to share their thoughts. Um, and again, I, I watch my, my wife do this in her sixth grade beginning band class. She asks questions regularly and the students are constantly communicating with each other, listening to each other's pass offs, giving feedback. And so she starts that at a young age. So um, for all the middle school uh, directors out there, if this is something that maybe you've never considered, you might, you might, um, might think about how you can have the students interact with each other and give feedback because then you're engaging them in all of the process in your classroom and not just when um, individuals are, are perhaps playing, but um, it, it's something that you have to build uh, and, and work toward. Um, I did Stephen Bryant's Dusk uh, at Michigan State with a concert band um, a couple years back, and we I let them rehearse it on their own. We kind of we set up the ensemble so they were facing each other, and I kind of guided the discussion. Um, and when when we kind of hit a roadblock, that's when I would use my score study or some of my musical ideas to kind of keep things moving along, but. Ultimately, they, they came to some conclusions on things that I didn't agree with, uh, and that's okay. Um, so I think that's just one thing to think about if you want to do this. But you can't just jump in the deep end of the pool. That won't work. So um, I'll defer to my colleagues maybe who have, have had some other experiences with this, but that was, those would be a couple of things to kind of get the, the conversation started. Great. Um, can we hear from Wendy next? I think... Uh, David hit on some of the things that I do that when he talked about his wife's experience. Um, you know, we start off very young with um, asking kids their opinion. Uh, in the very earliest stages, we might we might play something as a teacher. We might model something two different ways and ask for them to have an opinion about either what they liked better, what was right or wrong about each way, um, and then we once the kids are a little bit more adept, then we're asking them to have those opinions about what they hear. We ask them to give feedback to one another. Um, sometimes that happens uh, in a large group, um, but very often I'll have kids partner up. And so they're with a partner and they're playing for one another. They're giving feedback to one another um, in collaborating and, and supporting one another in their own, own growth. Um, that happens quite a bit in the first year of playing. So the kids are really very, very used to that. And then as we move and advance them more in their skills, um, we're asking kids for their opinion about um, things they like or they don't like, whether it's something that happens live in rehearsal, whether it's um, we've made a recording of a rehearsal or we've made a recording of a performance and asking the kids to weigh in. Um, it, it's become a regular a regular part of our rehearsals. Um, there's time that we spend every day um, asking kids for their input and asking them for them to have those opinions. And, you know, to me, um, when we started doing this, I was 
pleasantly surprised at how intuitive they were, um, how, how intelligently they could speak about what they heard. Um, certainly there's some just regurgitating, you know, what they think we want to hear or what they hear us say all the time. But some of them are very, very adept at being able to make smart comments. It's eye-opening and it's, it's great. Great, thank you, Wendy. Um, can we hear from Dr. Peterson next? Um, sure, I'll, I will just echo what um, what Wendy and David said. I, you know, students are really um, um, they're really smart, and you know, you ask them those deep questions about music, they have great answers. And I think if you're teaching them, um, you have to trust that their ideas and maybe their interpretations are the are the right way to go. Um, or a way to go, and that's not wrong. And and we are trying to teach them to be independent musicians. So, you know, I like to think we're no longer that maestro on the box telling them what to do. We're, we're it's a collaborative approach to making music. Um, and I started this when I when I first talked about score study and getting to the first rehearsal and into the final performance. Um, I think we come at it with our knowledge and our study and all the things we've learned. I think in college, you and you got to know all this stuff, and then you get to that first rehearsal and it's nothing like what you had had planned for or had studied. So they work on you and you work on them and they work on you and eventually you come together for an interpretation that is going to be what it is on the time that it's it's time to perform it. And um, I, think, I think that's a beautiful thing. So I think we have to be able to trust that students know a lot and they're gonna help us to get to the right place where that ensemble is gonna be for the performance. Awesome, and Chip, let's hear from you. Yeah, so if, if you're not familiar with the book, the, the Talent Code by Daniel Coyle, he has a great chapter in there um, that talks about deep practice and really effective practice from all his, his study, uh, really all kinds of disciplines, not just, just music. And he broke deep practice down into having a goal. And for us as musicians, that goal would be a mental image of what we want it to sound like. Um, making an attempt at that goal and failing measuring the distance between the attempt and the goal and then trying again and failing better and just kind of going through that process of trying, measuring, trying and failing, measuring until you finally hit that goal. Um, and if you think about our typical traditional rehearsals, um, the, all that measuring, which is the most important goal, besides having the goal, the most important step is the measuring. All that measuring in the traditional rehearsal is done by the director. And the more we can get that measuring off of our responsibility and onto the kids responsibility I think the quicker they will improve and get better as well um, and so for for me the questions I find myself asking is is uh, what's the difference what's the difference between what we just did and what we just played and we start fourth grade beginners um, and I with our fourth grade beginners I can demonstrate a line they can play that line and I can say all right what's the difference between what you just did and I just did and, and they can answer that. Or even if we're, if we're just saying something, if, we're, if, 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 I'm, if I say it with, with an energy and they repeat it back to me without that same energy, I won't tell them to give me more energy. I'll just ask them, what's the difference? And they'll they always do, oh, well, you said it louder, you had more energy, that type of thing. And so they're making that correction again. Um, the, other, the other questions I like to ask, um, um, and these are stolen from an Amanda Drinkwater session that she did at Midwest a few years ago that was just stunning, is, is you, you do the rep and then the question is, what, what are, you, are you going to do better on this next repetition? So trying to get them as an individual thinking of their, what are they personally gonna do better? And the other question is, what can we do better on this next rep? Um, and I, I tend to shy away from the yes or no questions, the affirmative, the, the, those types of questions. But if I'm going to be asking questions, they're going to be a little more open-ended and I'm going to allow the time in the rehearsal because um, it does take more time. And if you do that full-blown Orpheus model, it takes a lot more time um, to, to have something prepared um, as well. And uh, Aris, I don't know if you know, if you know that there's a, uh, a session by Scott Jones on YouTube uh, with that Orpheus model um, from the Midwest Clinic that if we can, I, yeah, I'll see if I can find it. We can link it in there too. So if you want to go full blown Orpheus, that that video is pretty inspiring. Great, thank you to you all. Um, so to end this evening, we thought we'd do a little bit of a uh, a lightning round here. Um, so if each of you could tell us what your one 
go to tried and true technique, rehearsal technique is, um, and we'll start with Dr. Peterson. Um, sing, buzz, wind pattern. Uh, and what I mean by that, that came from my trumpet playing days. If you can wind pattern, think of the ensemble wind pattern, the rhythm, um, it, it fixes all the stuff. It fixes uh, centering the notes, the, the air is moving the right way. And then you have their brass players buzz it. It fixes intonation and, and tone quality and um, pitch center. Um, so sing, buzz, wind pattern, and you can do it in any kinds of different combinations. The first time you have your brass players buzz, your woodwinds will go crazy. They'll love it. But I guarantee your brass section will sound better. And if you're applying that to what some of my colleagues said before about like brass being the foundation and the woodwinds kind of fit into that, it's going to make your group sound better. And if you could just explain what wind pattern is. For oh, wind patterning is, um, so on your hand, oh, you're wind patterning whatever the rhythm in the line is and you have everybody do that and so it's really getting the air to be behind their articulation and the tongue because i think air is more important than tongue great thank you and dr thornton um i am gonna say something maybe a little different and i have found that i when i remove myself from the performance and, and don't conduct and get out of their way the music is somehow better because they're communicating and relying on each other more. So that may be something for everybody to experiment with if you haven't uh, had an opportunity to do that is step off the podium and have them play together without you. That would be my nugget. Wonderful, Wendy. Um, shorten the feedback loop. Have them play something, give them one thing to fix with a quick comment, we talk too much, and then do it again and then just get those reps in, continually giving them feedback so that they can continue to improve their performance. Great, thank you, and Chip? Yeah, I actually, I already used the one I was gonna use for this. I was gonna use singing, singing scales to develop intonation, um, but I'll, instead I'll use uh, kind of extending on what Beth said is, is you have to have a mental image of what you want it to sound like as a performer. So while you're playing, you should be hearing it in your head um, exactly the way you want it to sound with such an intensity that you can't hear anything else. And then the brain just makes it happen. Wonderful. And our last lightning round question here, if you could go back to your first year of teaching and give yourself one piece of advice, what would that be? And let's start with Wendy on this. Don't try to change everything the first year. Be patient. Love it. And Chip. I, honestly, I don't know if I change anything. I learned a lot, and uh, those experiences really kind of informed my next the next twenty four years of my career. All right, great. And David. Find people in your area or your state that you can connect with and ask every question imaginable. Don't be on an island by yourself. Ask for help. And I would also say record every rehearsal and listen to it. I, I, I've started doing that far too late in my, in, my, in my time. I wish I would have done that right away. Thank you. And Beth. I would tell myself not to take the kid with resting bitch face personally. Um, and I, excuse the language. Hi, Josh. But um, I just used to get so upset when that kid had that face that they, they weren't into it. They didn't like the music. They didn't like me. And, um, and nine times out of 10, it had nothing to do with me. It had to do with their lives and something was happening in their family or their home. And, um, and it, it's not about you. It's about the music. So do the music well. And don't worry, you know, we reach out to those kids who don't seem to be having a good day. Um, but they're probably not upset with you. And I was too worried about if kids liked me or not. I didn't realize this was not PG. Sorry, I would have, everybody. Oh my gosh. <laughs> You're all like, you know. <laughs> Come on, it's um, 7.30 at night. Amazing. Um, okay, well, thank you all so much for um, this wonderful evening of learning. Um, and thank you to my co-moderator, Dr. Golden, as well. 
Um, just a reminder that if you want to download um, a copy, a transcript of the chat, if you hit the three dots on the right there, there is an option to save chat. And so that's, uh, you can access all the resources that we included in there as well. Um, once again, thank you to Chip Stefano, Wendy Hignan, David Thornton, and Beth Peterson for joining us tonight. And uh, we hope you all will join us next week. Um, information will be going out shortly where we, we will be discussing creating a culture of excellence. And our guests will be Tiffany Hitz, Barry Hauser, and Myra Roden. So thank you so much, and we hope to see you all. Thank you. He left. As did Beth. You kicked her out because she said a bad word. That's what you did. That's exactly what? right. <laughs> did you stop recording yet, Messina? I have not. <laughs>